So, so yeah, so I'm here to talk about this. This is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a Raspberry Pi? There we go. That's awesome. So, I, so I'm, I'm still in. I'm still kind of mentally in this in this place where this time a year ago I had a spreadsheet on my computer that told me where every Raspberry Pi in the world was. So it's kind of it's just it's it's great. You know, several of you here I don't know. So that's that's really encouraging. Um, that's a Raspberry Pi. For those those of you who haven't seen Raspberry Pis, um, I have two. Are there any personal injury lawyers in in the room? Okay, in that case. <laughs> Okay, these do need these do need. I'm afraid to come back because they are the door they are the door prizes. But uh, I'll bang that over there. Cool. Um, feel free to unbox it and uh, take a take a look at it, so you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, okay, I guess today I thought my my talk title is uh, inspiring future generations with open hardware. I guess what I wanted to do was I want to talk a little bit about um, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, why a group of us thought that there was a problem uh, and why we thought we could solve it with something that looked like that. Um, I, I wanted to make a, just a few, a few general comments, I guess, about um, the open bit of that title there and maybe some risks that uh, some of us in the foundation uh, have, there some concerns that we have about the risk of an increasing level of closure um, in the hardware that we're, that we're coming to use at the moment. Um, so talk a little bit about the problem, give you a little bit of the, the story of Raspberry Pi, how we got from, from thinking there was a problem, and that's now quite a long time ago. I'm aware I've been giving variants on this talk for so long that all of my, I say it's been a six-year journey, it's really now getting on towards the point where it's been a seven-year journey. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened and about where we've got to now. Um, and then I was going to conclude, I don't really have any slides for my talk, but I was going to conclude just with a few pictures that I think illustrate, we've been in the wild for six or seven months now. Um, uh, I, have some, I have some pictures which I, um, uh, which I think illustrate some of the uses that people have been putting Pi to. So, um, as James mentioned, um, Pi, uh, Pi for me is something that comes out of uh, the end of my time as a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Um, I, was, uh, I, came up to, I came up to Cambridge in 1996 as an undergraduate, and at that point we had a, uh, a very healthy, typical Cambridge application ratio. Yeah, we had a six to one application, uh, application ratio, so we could pick, uh, we could pick very, very carefully. Uh, and we were, we were overwhelmed, uh, not just with candidates, but, but with incredibly high quality candidates. So of the people we let in the door, uh, and probably a lot of the people we rejected, uh, we could rely on all of those people having, um, uh, you know, having been programming, having uh, maybe even as much as a decade of experience of programming computers. I came in the door with a couple of, knowing a couple of kinds of assembly language, and that was a pretty typical skill set. And in fact, the problem that uh, the faculty had at that point was not so much um, uh, teaching, not so much kind of bringing people up to speed as convincing these people who came in the door that we didn't know everything. Um, now, fortunately, we had, a thing called, um, we had a thing called functional programming that we would subject our first years to. Um, we could uh, you know, hit uh, so, uh, these enormously accomplished um, young people would come in the door. We'd hit them over the head with standard ML for eight weeks. And then when they were kind of on the floor at the end of that, we could then start to build them up. And of course, being able to have such a fast start is enormously important, certainly in the Cambridge system, because um, we have over a three-year course, only 60 weeks of contact time to turn somebody from a sixth former into somebody who can start a PhD. So being able to make a really fast start was extremely useful. And to some extent, the department had got very fat and happy on this stream of, this stream of very talented people. Now, by the time I was finishing, I was finishing my PhD in 2005, um, and I took a job um, as a director of studies. Now, people who've been through the Cambridge system they will, will know the job of a director of studies is to uh, organize the undergraduate teaching. Um, and is organized undergraduate teaching and also to organize the supply of new undergraduates. So to go out to schools and evangelize whatever subject it is you're, uh, you're, you're pushing, uh, and then to interview, people in, uh, to interview people who come in the door in December and try and decide who to, who to take on. Um, and it was kind of a little bit disappointing because what I found was over those 10 years between my arriving as an undergraduate uh, and my starting to interview new undergraduates, um, the number of people applying to read computer science at Cambridge had halved. Uh, we'd gone from maybe 500 applicants for 80 or 90 places to, uh, to maybe 250. Uh, so that's still, a, that's still you know, good, a, good, a good cover ratio, but it's nothing like what we were used to. Uh, but more alarming for us, um, the average skill set of the people coming in the, in, coming in the door had changed from a bunch of assembly language and graphics hacking to maybe having done some HTML, maybe a little bit of web programming if, they, if we were lucky. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, 
Um, and these are still extremely bright people. We're still able to fill our, fill our lecture halls with 80 or 90 very bright young people. But the problem was that we had to spend a lot of time in our first year um, bringing people up to a level of skill that we'd previously been able to assume. And this was obviously extremely worrying for the university. Um, anything that's worrying in that way for a university is probably going to be worrying for industry shortly thereafter. You know, if, if, people, if, we, if people stop coming into, into university in su sufficient number in year X, in year X plus three or X plus four, they're going to stop turning up at, uh, in industry. Um, subsequently, I've ended up in industry, and I have this... Um, it, it's just subtly disquieting to look around at the number of people in their late 20s and their 30s, and then the number of people in their early 20s. Uh, increasingly for us, well, I work for a company called Broadcom, increasingly for us, recruitment means... Uh, poaching away mid-career mid people from other companies rather than being able to bring in as many um, graduate hires as we'd like to be able to. So a group of us in academia were worried about this. Um, a group of people in uh, ca the, Cambridge, the Cambridge cluster were worried about this. Um, and we started to wonder, A, why this had happened to us, and B, whether there was anything we could do to try and fix the problem. Um, and the hypothesis we came up with, and for us it really still is a hypothesis. This is still a working hypothesis for us, and it'll remain a hypothesis for four or five years until we see whether what we've done with Raspberry Pi actually starts to have an effect on admissions. The hypothesis we had was um, most of the people of my age learned to program on 8-bit microcomputers. We learned to program at the age of 9 or the age of 10 or the age of 11 on a machine that we had in our bedrooms. And of my friends at, uh, of my friends at school... Um, many, many people, not people who eventually went into tech, into tech careers, but just people who went into all sorts of careers, knew at least how to write that two-line program, 10, print I am the best, 20, go to 10, uh, or something much, much filthier than that, and then to go into Dixon's and type that into every machine in Dixon's, <laughs> and hit enter and then run out of the door. So what this meant was, and that was enormously good fun, of course, but what it meant was that everybody my age um, who has an aptitude for computing had a chance to discover they had an aptitude for computing, or engineering in general, um, uh, and had a chance to develop, had a platform sitting there in their bedroom that they probably hadn't even bought in order to learn to program on, that they bought to play games on, or they, they bought to do their, their, their schoolwork on, that they could, uh, they could use to develop that aptitude. Um, and that was really fantastic. Um, starting in, I guess, the late 1980s, um, that ecosystem, that wonderful ecosystem, and to some extent quite a peculiarly British ecosystem. You know, we seem to have, although all countries had, uh, I guess all countries had the Commodore 64, and most countries had a national champion computer, uh, their BBC Micro equivalent. Uh, there seem to be just more of these companies. You know, the Jupiters uh, and the uh, the Jupiters and the Tangerines. You know, the little little small speculative computer companies that maybe never went anywhere. Um, in this country. So this ecosystem um, was largely destroyed. Um, and it was destroyed by two things. Um, it was destroyed from below by games consoles. Uh, people who had been buying Spectrums to play computer games on started to buy Segas and Nintendos to play games on. Um, the interesting thing about those platforms is they're not just not programmable, but they're not programmable by their very business model. They are designed to not be programmable. They are closed platforms, and they're closed platforms because they're typically sold at a loss, uh, and the platform holder wishes to recover that loss through royalties on the software, so they need to control what goes onto the device. And so that kind of probably brings me to the, to the, the concern, this concern that we have around openness, is this word open here. Um, I've lived my entire life in an environment where we have ready access to powerful, open, programmable hardware. Um, and because it's been that way all my life, it's very easy for me to imagine that this is just a, a, a fact of nature, that this is just the way the world has to be. So the majority of users of computers are never going to be computer programmers. Right? The majority of users of computers are going to be consumers of computer programs, not, uh, not producers of computer programs. But because we have this open hardware, we're in an environment where the producers are, in a sense, subsidized by the consumers. Um, games consoles provide a very instructive image of what the alternative environment looks like. A PlayStation, if I want to write a game for a, if I want to write a, game for a Windows PC, I can go buy a Windows PC. And that Windows PC costs me, the games programmer, the same amount of money that it will cost the, author, the, the people who, who, buy my, um, who buy my game. Um, if I wish to write a, a PlayStation 
computer game, I have to go and buy a PlayStation development kit. Now, that's problematic for two reasons. One, I need to get myself on the list of people who are allowed to buy a PlayStation development kit, so not everyone's going to be able to do that. Secondly, while a PlayStation costs maybe 200 pounds, a PlayStation development kit costs 10 or 20,000 pounds. So closed platforms do not have that nice property that um, producers can free ride on the back of, on the economies of scale provided by consumers. And they don't have the, the kind of the democratic impact that anyone uh, with, without regard to you know, who they know can start developing content. So open is, open, is, open is extremely important. And open is extremely important for getting people like children involved in programming. Because children don't have connections. If you're a child and you phone up Sony and say, I wish to write a PlayStation game, um, I expect that Sony will not respond positively to that. Uh, uh, to, even if the child turns up with 20,000 pounds, they're probably not going to be allowed to do that. So open is extremely important, particularly, it's open is extremely important for all of us in this room. We've all benefited from this. Um, but it's particularly important in education. And it is a thing which is under a constant degree of threat. Uh, it is particularly at threat under the, uh, at the moment, as we see an increasing move towards um, uh, appliance computing, towards, uh, towards tablet-like computing, uh, towards a world in which you could imagine that 99% of platforms, that all of the volume will go, all of that consumer volume that pays for uh, fun programmable hardware will, will run off in the direction of appliance devices which are purely used to consume. So that was one of the two things, and that was, so this is 20 years ago. So this is one of the two things that killed off those machines. The other thing that killed off those machines was just increasing sophistication of general purpose computers. So the PC is an awesomely programmable piece of hardware. It's probably more programmable in a lot of ways than the machines that I grew up with. However, you have to choose to program it. You can't simply, it's not a machine that you turn on and it goes beep and beguiles you into programming. Um, where a BBC Micro, the first thing you have to choose to do with the BBC Micro is not to program it. Um, you have to choose to uh, put a cassette in and type chain star, I think. That's about right. Uh, you have to choose to do that. Um, on a PC, you have to choose to go and get the tools. You have, to choose, you have to decide that you wish to be a computer programmer. You have to choose to go and get the tools. You have to choose to go and get the documentation. Um, and that really, it's a tiny little barrier. It's a 10-minute barrier. You know? um, maybe for the first five years, maybe in 1990 to 95, before we all had internet connections, it was a little bit longer than that. You actually had to send off your, your programming tools. But certainly these days, it's a tiny barrier. And yet a vast number of young people end up stuck up against that barrier, a 10-minute barrier. It's like living 10 minutes from a fantastic playground and you never drive there. So our hypothesis, our working hypothesis, is that these two effects, these two things together, undermined our supply of um, people who are interested in and experienced with computers. Um, and prevented an entire generation, now two or three generations, of children who had engineering aptitude from ever discovering that aptitude and ever developing it. So that's our hypothesis. And a group of us started to wonder um, what we could do about it. Um, we had this idea that maybe there was a niche. Maybe a niche had been created by the disappearance of these machines. Maybe there was a niche for a machine that could find a place in the child's life um, that would be interesting to them for some other reason, but which was, program which was programmable, which would, again, start to beguile people into programming. And we came up with the idea We came up with the idea that a platform like this would have to uh, a platform like this would have to satisfy four requirements. Um, first of all, it would have to be interesting. We have to remember, as I said, people did not buy their 1980s computers in order to learn to program on. They bought them to do some other interesting thing, and that was often games. Um, and they were just beguiled into programming. So we wanted something that wasn't just a really bare bones programming machine. And in fact, early on, we attempted to build machines like that. And what we found was that they were just not interesting to children. So we decided we needed to have a machine that had a reasonable amount of graphics grunt. You know, we settled on games again, so we wanted something. What we've ended up with is a device which is more powerful. Than, it's not a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 360. More, more powerful than a Nintendo Wii in terms of its graphics capabilities can play Blu-ray video. So we've ended up with something which has one or two things that it can do which are not programming, which we think are interesting to kids. Oh, the third one is Surf the Web, so you can go on Facebook, um, the, if you're over 13. So, the, um, <laughs> um, so that was one of the things. Um, another thing we thought was, obviously, it had to be programmable, and we wanted a device that had enough storage that we could bundle every programming. Uh, we wanted to eliminate all these little 10-minute 10, 10 steps in people's lives. So we 
Uh, we wanted something that had enough storage that we could bundle everything from Logo and Scratch for your four, or four to eight year olds to Python for middle school students to a C, to a C compiler and a bunch of standard libraries. Um, so uh, we wanted something that was fun, programmable, robust. We have this idea that this is supposed to be a thing that belongs to the child. This is not supposed to be something that you kit out, that you buy a class set for necessarily in class, and then just have one class set which is shared around. This is supposed to belong to the child. And so if it's going to belong to the child, and the child is going to do stuff with it at home and at school, we want it to be able to, you know, want to be able to shove it in your, that one's full of radio mic, um, shove it in your pocket and take it out of your pocket a hundred times and nothing bad happens to it. And kind of also that kind of implied to us kind of small. It had to be kind of portable. Um, and finally, it had to be cheap, because we were aware that we were going to ask people to go and buy this machine. Uh, in you know, large numbers of people go and buy this machine, often large numbers of people who don't necessarily have vast amounts of money. Um, we often get asked, actually, why the hell are you building a computer, right? There are computers everywhere. Every household has a computer. It's just simply not true. Um, outside the comfortable middle classes, there are vast numbers of households which only have appliance computing devices, which have set-top boxes and mobile phones. Uh, but which have nothing that looks like a PC. Um, I, I, was at a party, I was at a party last year, and uh, I met this uh, young boy who was about nine, and he was really excited about computers, and, he, and his mother was there, and she was talking about how excited he was about computers. And I said, um, after a while, I said, that's cool, so what sort of computer have you got? Uh, and uh, she said, oh, a Nintendo Wii. You know, and there are vast numbers of households that are like this, so we're going to ask people to go and buy a general purpose computing device, so it had to be cheap. Um, and the, the price we settled on was the price of a textbook. So we thought $25, that's the price of a textbook, uh, which is complete nonsense, of course. Textbooks are much, much more expensive than that. Um, I wish we had known this. If we'd known this, it would have made our engineering much, much easier. You know, we wouldn't have spent so, much, so, so, so long uh, optimizing to a cost target. Um, but so we wanted to have this thing which was fun and programmable and robust and cheap. Um, and we, uh, a bunch of us, um, started hacking away at machines. So there's a bunch of us in Cambridge and um, a chap called uh, uh, Pete Lomas, who's up in Warrington and who is, I think, in the Manchester audience. So, you, so people in Manchester can bother him afterwards. Um, and ask him to stand up and identify himself at the end of the talk. Um, the, um, so anyway, this group of us uh, started wondering about what we could build. Um, I went to work for a company called Broadcom. I, I um, didn't stick at the university. So I went to work for a company called Broadcom. And the lovely thing about Broadcom, for whom I still work, um, is that we make these mobile phone chips that have enormously powerful graphics processors in. And so by about 2009, we'd actually managed to throw together a prototype machine based around um, a Broadcom graphics processor, which met all of our requirements, or we thought would meet all of our requirements. And obviously, cost is a requirement that's extremely hard to hit until you're really building in significant volume. So we thought we were doing pretty well. Um, and we were trying to solve, uh, still trying to solve a very little problem. Yeah, we were trying to solve the problem for Cambridge. We really promote, we were really parochial people. We thought, you know, if we just get another hundred kids, or we can just get the kids who are coming in and get, make sure that they know a little bit more when they come in the door, that'll solve our problem. So we were really thinking in terms of a thousand Raspberry Pis. We thought that'd be a lot of Raspberry Pis, or ten thousand Raspberry Pis over the, the lifetime of the project. Um, and we were we were kind of pottering along at our own rate. And then, and because uh, a number of the people who are on the um, uh, board of Trustees and the foundation that we incorporated to try and pursue this, have a connection with the BBC Micro. Um, uh, most notably as a chap called David Braben. Anyone played Elite? There we go. Uh, so there's a chap called David Braben, one of our trustees. Uh, Elite was probably the best game for the BBC Micro. I uh, got my start on the BBC Micro, so we're basically the same. Um, and um, we really wanted to put a BBC brand on this. We wanted to put a BBC brand on this, on this product so badly. And we kept having these meetings. We had meetings up with BBC R&D in Manchester and meetings down in London. And we really wanted to put a BBC brand on this. Um, and what we discovered, of course, is that the BBC is no longer able. Today, the BBC could not do the BBC micro project. The BBC is a state-funded entity. It cannot just go and muscle in on the world of making computers anymore. It would just wouldn't work. Um, and our very last attempt to do this was in May of last year. Um, we went to see a guy called Rory Kethlin Jones. Um, who uh, uh, also told us no. Um, but what he did say was, could I take a video of, your, of, of this thing and, uh, and put, it, I put it on my blog? You know, I, was, I think it's an interesting idea, what you're trying to do. I, BBC can't support it formally, but I like it. Um, so, and because we're idiots, we said yes. Uh, and so there were, um, uh, Rory filmed a, a video of David holding up a very early prototype of this board um, and put it on his blog. And we got 600,000 YouTube views in two days. Um, which was really fantastic, because I was sitting there pressing F5, uh, and, my, uh, and how popular are you, but number was going up. Um, 
Oh, no, yeah, I didn't do any work at Broadcom those two days. Um, and the, um, uh, and, on the, the, and I felt really fantastic. And all of us at the foundation felt, felt fantastic. And on the, um, uh, the second day, I sat down for dinner with my wife, Liz, and uh, across the dinner table. And we suddenly realized that we promised 600,000, we, we were a charitable foundation with no money, and we promised 600,000 people that we'd build them a $25 computer. Uh, and that was a really awful experience. <laughs> and so, to some extent, for all of us in the foundation, the last year has been a story, uh, the last now year and a half almost, has been a story about us trying to make good on that promise that we ended up accidentally making to a much larger constituency than the one that we originally had in mind for Raspberry Pi. Um, so, how did it go? Um, we said it'd be great to get this out by the end of the year. Yeah, we said, let's try and get it out in Q4. And we made a public statement. We, people were, get, the press were getting in touch with us in the aftermath of this thing with Rory. And we said, yeah, we're going to try and get this out in Q4. Um, uh, we, learned a, we learned a real lesson there. Um, if you say Q4, people average. There's an averaging tendency. Q4 means the 15th of November. Um, <laughs> on the 16th of November last year, I saw my first story in the press, Raspberry Pi is late. Um, we, um, so so there, was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of frantic engineering. We had an enormous amount, although this has never been a Broadcom project, there's always been, a, there's always been kind of a, a theory out in the wild that this is a sneaky Broadcom strategic marketing project to get this chip into all of your hands. Um, it really isn't, but we have had a lot of soft support from Broadcom. Um, one thing that Broadcom did for us was that they manufactured for us our first 50 what we called alpha boards, which is like a Raspberry Pi but bigger and much more expensive. They cost $177 to make. Um, uh, the, so so they're, they're, they were never going to be the real deal. But they are electrically, uh, they make a great software development platform, and they allowed us to prove out the design at the schematic level. Um, then um, between, and those came back in August, and people were really quite impressed with some of the software we were able to run on them. Um, and then really between August and December uh, was a big effort um, to cost reduce this device, an effort largely run by, run by Pete, to, to, to cost reduce this device. Um, and I, uh, we got our, what we called, beta boards, which were supposedly manufacturing candidates. Um, I got a phone call from Pete when I was somewhere up on Dartmoor on the 22nd of December to say, they've come back and they don't boot. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there was one thing wrong with the board. Um, so uh, the next day, I got a phone call from someone at the office in Broadcom to whom Peter FedEx the board saying, they boot. So we had some working devices. We had these working beta boards. We had 25 beta boards. They mostly worked. And so we were able to do an, uh, a paper launch. We were able to do an NVIDIA-style paper launch. On the 31st of December, we sold 10 Raspberry Pis on eBay. And we sold them for $1,000 each <laughs> at auction. And that was really, and that was fantastic because, you know, we, we have always, you know, one of the things that Raspberry Pis always struggled for is always struggled for money. Um, because we're a charitable foundation. We can't go, we have a device which is profitable to manufacture. Um, and uh, we've never been able to go out and raise any risk capital. Um, and while, and so it was great, we got $10,000. Um, but it was actually very worrying when we thought about it. Because when we thought about it, what this meant was there was so much interest in the pie that people would bid $1,000 for a beta board. Um, and we had one other indication that things might be going wrong. And that was that to keep people's interest up while, while we waited to provide them with pies, we put an operating system, this thing boots from an SD card, and we put an operating system image up on the, um, uh, up on the, um, uh, up on the internet and uh, for people to play with. And we got uh, just, in fact, really to kind of unzip and have a look at, we got 50,000 downloads. And that was really worrying because in our minds we'd be thinking 600,000 people, they're probably all rubberneckers, right? There's probably actually really is only 1,000 people. Um, and so we'd capitalized up. We'd all of our trustees, we'd all put money in the, uh, put money in the pot. Um, and we'd managed to capitalize up so we could make 10,000 Raspberry Pis. And then we found out that there were 50,000 people so hardcore in their interest in Raspberry Pi, they were prepared to download a two gigabyte image for a uh, machine that didn't exist yet and that they had no idea when they were going to get, and it was of alpha quality. Um, and that was the point where we realized that, really realized that we were going to have a surprise in the way of, in the way of volumes. We had thought, we'll make 10,000, we'll wait until they sell out, and then we'll have got our money back, and we'll make another 10,000. And we started to think, you know, shit, we might actually sell 10,000 units in the first few weeks. And then that's going to cause a real problem. There'll then be a, there'll then be a shortage while we make another 10,000. At this point, we were very lucky to, uh, to, to bump into two companies uh, called um, Electric Components and Premier Farnell. Um, and the lovely thing is, these are companies who share our concern. They share our concern about the supply of engineers because engineers are their lifeblood. And so concerned were they. And so, you know, 
interested in Raspberry Pi, were they, that they agreed to manufacture them for us. And this was really, this has really been the, the engine that's enabled us to do interesting stuff with Raspberry Pi this year at volume, is that these companies do not simply buy Raspberry Pis from us and distribute them, but they license the design for Raspberry Pi and the trademark from us, and they commission the build of Raspberry Pi. Um, and they also provide all the distribution and customer service. Um, and what this has meant, uh, so we, um, in the last two months before launch, between those 10 units and launch day, we completely changed what it is that we do. We were going to be a very capital-constrained, ma regular manufacturing company. Uh, and we turned ourselves into an IP licensing company, and that's really been our salvation, I think, this year. Uh, we launched on the 29th of February, which was really stupid because it denies us the opportunity for a first anniversary party. Um, we're we're going to have a really great fourth anniversary party. We're going to save up all of that money, uh, invest it somewhere. Um, so, so, we, so we launched on the 29th of February. Uh, we sold 100,000 Raspberry Pis on the first day. Um, <laughs> so so the, um, the, that was the right, definitely the right thing to do, to do the licensing thing. Um, uh, obviously, you know, this year there's been a lot of struggles to get the thing out of the door. Um, and um, we have... Uh, to date shipped 400,000 400, Raspberry Pis, and we think we're on track to... Thank you. Um, we're on track, we think, to do a million units by our first anniversary. We won't quite get to a million units this calendar year, but we think we can probably get to a million units by, by the end of February. Um, I was looking at the foundations... So we're in, we're in a good place. But I was looking at the foundation's founding documents the other day, uh, as you do, um, and um, it's a laugh a minute in my house. And um, the, um, we, uh, I had a look, and nowhere in those founding documents does it say we are going to build a lot of little computers for everyone. Um, what it actually says is we're going to get kids programming again. And so really for us, we're now at this point where we've, we've accomplished this, this, what I think is a, is a wonderful thing. You know, it's really exciting. Um, but it wasn't the thing we were intending to accomplish. And therefore, very much for us as a foundation, the next year has got to be about kind of starting to pivot around and turn back towards actually accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish. And that means several things. It means software, but most importantly, it means teaching materials. It means the things that you need in order for... We're starting to see, this academic year, Raspberry Pi being used in some schools by some teachers who typically... You know, the, the two things that I, I love that I've already seen with Pi, we're seeing some teachers, not necessarily IC, some ICT teachers, but some physics teachers, teachers in all sorts of subjects, who happen to have a personal passion for computing, using this as a way to inspire kids around them. And that's amazing. Um, the other really lovely thing we're seeing is we're seeing parents... Um, using these as a way to talk to their kids. Engin parents who are engineers using these devices as a way to talk to their children about what it is that they do in their jobs. Uh, and we have, we just get wonderful emails, really heartwarming emails that keep us going that, uh, from people who say, you know, my kid was never interested in programming a PC. All he wanted to do on a PC was go and, you know, go on Facebook. Uh, I'll show him a Raspberry Pi. And actually something about the fact that it's really bare bones and approachable made him think, oh, I'm going to try doing this. And before you know it, he's making a little cat run across the screen. And he's, you know, he's like, I made a cat run across the screen. So that's, and that's extremely nice. So we are starting to see some use of Raspberry Pi in inspiring kids. Um, to really accomplish our mission, though, we need to make this something that can be delivered everywhere. And we need this to be something that can be delivered because of the, we have a skill shortage, not just in ICT, or in engineering subjects, but we have a skill shortage in the teaching of engineering subjects. This needs, we need to turn this into something which can be delivered into a, what we sometimes call a tech-phobic environment. I'm not sure that's probably the right word, but certainly an environment where uh, we cannot rely on uh, a high level of intrinsic technical understanding in the people delivering the course. Um, and that's really what we're going to spend the next year doing. This is a wonderful time to be doing Raspberry Pi. We are enormously lucky that there is a realisation, there is a broad realisation that we are really in trouble uh, as a country from the point of view of STEM skills. Um, obviously, it helped to have Eric Schmidt turn up last summer and tell the government that they were out of their minds to be throwing away Britain's uh, heritage. Um, the various, in, various innovations that have come out of, various um, reports that have come out of places um, particularly the Royal Society, the, um, uh, the Livingston Hope Report has been enormously influential. The games industry seems to have really, the games and visual effects industry really appear to have taken the lead in trying to bang the drum about how there's a problem. So we're in a position where we think we can, we think we, ha we, think we have a product that can be used to solve this, this problem. 
uh, we have made a lot of noise. And really, we have this two-year period now while the government revises the curriculum. While we, you know, currently, there is an ICT curriculum, but they, there's, there's a thing called disapplication has happened. So although there is an ICT cur curriculum, you as a school are free to ignore what it says and go and do whatever you want with the time and the money. Um, we have a two-year period um, of opportunity to decide what we want to do. Uh, and Raspberry Pi is enjoying being, as a foundation, is enjoying being part of that discussion. So just to prove that people, I know many of you have Raspberry Pis, just to prove that people do fun stuff with Raspberry Pis, I have the shortest of slideshows of things that I've seen over the last six months that I've enjoyed. Um, first, a few projects people have done with this. We didn't see this one coming at all. This is music synthesis. People are using Raspberry Pis as, this is a, a four-note polyphony digital analog synth. Um, that runs on the Pi, and it's called Piano. And I think that's actually going to be a commercial product. We're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing people use Raspberry Pi in commercial products. And I think we're, we're extremely relaxed about this. People do sometimes ask us whether we mind other people, make, or because we don't make money out of Raspberry Pi as individuals. People sometimes ask us whether we mind other people making money. And of course we do. We, of course we don't. That's right. <laughs> we hate those people. Um, so anyway, so this, is, so this, I believe, is going to be a commercial product, and it's going to be a commercial product real soon. Uh, what's the next one? You'll like the next one, I'm sure. There we are, beer. Uh, who doesn't like beer? Um, it's amazing how many people's first reaction to a Raspberry Pi is, I can use this to brew beer. Um, <laughs> and not just homebrew. You know, I would have thought, you know, homebrew. But this, there's a thing called Brew Pi now, which is an open source brewery control that you can use to control up to medium scale craft microbrew breweries. Uh, and it presents a beautiful web interface that you can use to tweak up your, uh, hopefully with plenty of security, you can use to tweak up the temperature of your mash. Um, so there you are, that's, that's fun. Um, come on, penguins. Um, yeah, we said we wanted to make the pie interesting to children in ways which are not about programming. We don't want to ram programming down their throats, we just want to kind of leave programming next to them and see if they pick it up. Um, one, a big part of this for us is about games. Uh, we're very hopeful that there will be a commercial games ecosystem around Raspberry Pi. This is not a commercial quality game, although that water effect is enormously expensive to render. Um, but this is Penguin's Puzzle, which was written by a good friend of mine in Cambridge, and which now ships with the Pi. You know, just trying to kind of make this an interesting and attractive thing for kids. Um, light. Yeah. Lots of people doing hardware interfacing projects with the Pi. And I have to confess that I'm a software engineer. Um, I, I will not, you know, I'm not an electrical engineer. Um, and so my imagining about what cool things people would do with the Pi were all software imaginings, even as recently as last year. I thought everyone, I thought we've got a fantastically powerful GPU on the device. And I thought, man, people are going to do great graphics demos. Because that's what I used to do when I was a kid, and it's the thing I care about. Almost everything that has been done with the Raspberry Pi that has been exciting to date has been, in one way or another, a hardware project. And this is a, um, we've, we've been very lucky. There's an organization called Adafruit, based in the US, um, who've taken the Pi and are really pushing it into the US market. This is a nice little persistence of vision light wand hack that they, uh, they did with the Pi fairly recently. Fish? Um, it's fish pie. Um, <laughs> I've got another one on the next slide. Um, I really hated the name when we first came up with it. Um, I, I, I was, I, um, the, the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry is fruit named computer companies, and Pi is the fact we were originally intending one of the doomed projects that, that was only a programming device, uh, only ran Python. So Pi is the Pi in Python, misspelled. Um, uh, but it does, it, uh, I hated it for the first year. I thought that was a great idea, shame we gave it a crap name. Um, and, uh, but it, it does keep giving. Uh, it does keep giving us wonderful little puns. This is supposed to be a remotely, op uh, an autonomous boat that is going to potter around the North Atlantic. It is a Kickstarter project. So if you want to, if you believe, if this picture makes you believe, then you can, uh, you can contribute to the, to the success of it. Um, this is the one I love. Uh, this one is called Pie in the Sky. Uh, um, this is a, a gentleman called uh, Dave Akerman. Uh, he's based in the south of England, and he, for a long time, has been putting digital still cameras and video cameras under um, uh, helium weather balloons and sending them up and taking pictures and then recovering the pictures when the, uh, when the device comes back down. This was his first attempt to use a Raspberry Pi to do that, and the nice thing was using a Raspberry Pi, he was able to send the pictures down live. So Raspberry Pi, from a heartbreaking 39,992 meters, um, so um, this is um, uh, a little QVGA picture of the Earth from near space, um, and it holds the record for the highest altitude pictures ever sent down from an amateur vehicle. Click. There we are. Um, Add-on boards. Um, uh, this big ecosystem appears to be appearing around, around the pie. This one's a thing called Gert board. Uh, it's a 
IO expansion and buffering board for the device. It gives the ability to do things like drive motors uh, and stuff. The foundation isn't really, one of the interesting things about the foundation is that we've got these very modest goals. Really all we want to do is we really want to make this thing and then we want to do the educational stuff. We don't necessarily want to, you see it doesn't come in a box and we'll get onto boxes in a moment. Um, this has left, by accident, an enormous amount of space, enormous amount of market space around the pie, enormous amount of space that people can use to go and, um, uh, to, to go and make money. And this is, this is a good example of that. In fact, developed by the guy who developed this is a friend of mine. Um, Arduino. Um, Arduino, um, this physical computing thing is really interesting because I think I'm a product of my time and I think the software is interesting. Uh, actually, if you look at what kids find interesting today, uh, making a little dot move around on the screen is remarkably nowhere near as cool as it used to be. Um, <laughs> what kids find interesting is making a little thing move around on the floor. Um, and if you go and look, you know, to the extent that there are bright spots um, in the, the, in the extent to which kids are engaging with, with electronics and, and, and engineering, the Arduino has had an enormous impact. Uh, you, if you go to a Maker Faire, one of these Maker Faire events, um, you see vast numbers of eight-year-old kids with, you know, like a little doll's house that's got lights that turn on and off when you flick switches, and almost all of this is done with Arduino. And there's been a real attempt, I think, because we kind of look a bit similar, uh, and we kind of a similar price, has been a real attempt to set us up as some sort of, like, competitor for Arduino, but actually we fit incredibly well together. I see a vast number of people now using Arduino and Pi. You know, what's good about Arduino? Very low power, very low cost. What's bad about Arduino? You need to have a host PC to run it from. What does Raspberry Pi give you? It's a very, very, very cheap host PC. So we're seeing an enormous amount of this sort of thing, people connecting Raspberry Pis and Arduinos together, kind of hoping our distributors will start to offer bundles at some point. Camera. I said we weren't getting into the add-on board business. We are getting into the add-on board business. There's two add-on boards we're going to make. One of them is, is a camera board. One of them is a display board. The camera board, of which this is a very early demo, uh, is going to be really, really useful because another thing we see a lot of enthusiasm for among kids is not just making robots that move around, but robots that move around and can interact with their environment. And this is going to be very useful. And this we can do very cheaply and at very high quality. I wrote a book. <laughs> I feel like it's such a whore. Um, <laughs> putting that on my slide deck. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, there is really, one of the nice things is, yes, okay, I wrote a book and you have to pay money for the book. There, one of the lovely things is, another ecosystem thing that is happening is there's a vast amount of free tutorial material around this device. Um, we've been very focused on the idea that um, there's not much point in building a $35 computer if you have to go and buy $100 of stuff in order to get any value out of it. To some extent, that's shown up in our use of televisions as displays and mobile phone power adapters as, as power supplies. But it's also shown up in our encouragement and you know, the extent to which we've promoted um, free tutorial material online. A really lovely free thing that's happened is this thing called Raspberry Jam. Anyone been to a Raspberry Jam? Okay, Raspberry Jams are great. Um, they are somewhere in the space between conferences and computer clubs and user groups and support clinics. Um, they, um, uh, they're a, a venue that people can use who've been doing stuff with Raspberry Pi to share the interesting stuff they've been doing with Raspberry Pi. And critically from the education point of view, they're a place that teachers who are interested in the Raspberry Pi but do not feel they have the confidence to deliver teaching material around the Raspberry Pi can go in order to find out more about the Raspberry Pi and to meet teachers who have successfully delivered Raspberry Pi based stuff in the classroom. And these things, the, from the foundation's point of view, the great, things about, the great thing about Raspberry Jams, we have nothing to do with them. They don't consume any of our time or energy. There's an enormously enthusiastic gentleman called Alan O'Donoghue, uh, who organizes and runs these things around the country um, pretty much off his own bat, which is fantastic. And these have happened as far afield now as Australia and uh, the west coast of the US. Another wonderful thing, we have a magazine with type in listings. Um, uh, I mean, I spent a lot of my time as a child typing in listings, and there seems to be something wonderful about when you type in, when you, if you type something in as opposed to downloading it from the internet, there's something wonderful. When you type it in, it goes through your eyes, through your brain, and out of your fingers. And, and at that point, you're, and you probably make a mistake, and from your mistake, you learn something interesting. And from it having gone through your brain, you get a little bit of ownership and understanding of what it does. So we have a magazine. Uh, again, this is nothing to do with us. This is just some very enthusiastic people. It's now on issue six. Uh, the first five issues, this is issue five. The first five issues were electronic magazines. The sixth issue was, is being printed. So it's actually a print magazine. And it's a print magazine specifically because teachers were, were getting asked by their kids whether there was anything that they could leave around that they could use to learn about the Raspberry Pi. And so this has been printed in order to provide collateral to leave around in classrooms. Uh, I got back from the US last week and I found a big pile of them on my doorstep and I should have brought them with me today. 
Um, I said we didn't make a you know, big ecosystem around the pie. We didn't case it. We didn't case it because we thought we were only going to make 1,000 of them, and injection molds cost 10,000 pounds. Uh, it didn't seem like a good spend of the money at the time. I'd love to claim we didn't case it because we were going to create a fantastic casing ecosystem, but uh, in practice, it was, it was an accident. But we created a fantastic casing ecosystem. Um, this, and, and they fill all the niches are filled. This is a very cheap case. This is a PDF that you can download and print onto the thickest card you can get through your printer. Um, it's an incite, living incitement to printer jams. Um, and it's called the Punnet. And you fold it up, and it makes a really good Raspberry Pi case. Um, Legos. Ah, yeah. So I, now I knew I should have edited this since I came back from the US. Um, uh, yeah, Legos. Um, this case was uh, the, the, the size of the board. We sort of wanted it to be credit card size, and it is so near to being credit card size. It's about a mill away in each direction from being a credit card. Um, we um, didn't realize that the size we had picked is an incredibly close multiple of the Lego basis unit size. <laughs> uh, and this means that cases made out of Lego fit really, really well. This case, this, this case was, was designed by a girl, 11 year old um, Girl Scout called Biz. Um, and you can now buy it online. You can buy a kit to make this online. Um, and Biz gets royalties. And because she's an 11 year old, she takes her royalties in Lego. Uh, so she now... <laughs> She now has more. She now has more Lego than anybody on Earth, or something like Legoland. Phone her up for loans. Anyway, so so so. But this is interesting, and this this some of this stuff is this this kind of peripheral stuff. It shows, I guess, for how how limited my imagining of what sort of creativity people would get up to if we gave them Raspberry Pis was. I was really thinking about graphics demos. I was not thinking about robots, and I wasn't thinking about that. This is Pibo. Uh, have any of you got a Pibo? Hey, there we go. Okay, Pibo's about 10 weeks old. I, 12 weeks old, maybe now. I saw a prototype. This is a, this is a case. This is the deluxe. This is the Rolls Royce of, of Raspberry Pi cases. Um, it's made out of stacked, laser-cut acrylic. Uh, it's one of the most incredible. I don't have one with me, annoyingly. Um, it's one of the most incredibly beautiful things I've ever seen. I saw this at the start of July for the first time, a prototype at a conference in Sheffield. Um, and there was a, a seven-year-old girl walking past. And uh, Paul Beach, who, ha who designed this and actually designed our logo for us as well, uh, took this out of his bag to show me. And this little girl was walking past, and her <laughs> head kind of snapped around like that. And she was like, oh, there it is. Oh, it's so pretty. Can I, can I come and get it and hold it up? Because it's just such a pretty thing. I want to touch it. <laughs> I will give it back, don't worry. I do have some at home. Sign it. We'll oh, oh, awesome. <laughs> oh. That's still weird. Um, so yeah, that's a pie bow when it's assembled. I mean, it's probably a small dot for most of you. Um, this, is, um, this is fantastic. And Paul Beach has sold 12,000 of these in 10, it's gone from nothing, from having one prototype to selling 12,000 of these and having a factory in Sheffield that makes them in 10 or 12 weeks. And this has been just, this is the, another really nice thing. Lots of ecosystem around it. Lots of people doing really fun stuff. We said we wanted to just buy kids. This is Mikey. Um, Mikey is off screen there. Well, he's got Lego case. Um, Mikey is off screen learning to use MIT Scratch. Uh, enormously popular for teaching kids. Uh, I think Mikey's dad is an engineer. So I think he's a, he's a member of that group of people who are you know, being shown how to program by, by, their, uh, by their parents. Um, I said we, we had a very parochial focus as Raspberry Pi. Interest in solving a little problem in the UK. Um, turns out everyone wants to program. Uh, these kids are in Uttar Pradesh in, uh, in India. Uh, and you can actually see on screen here, we have MIT Scratch down there. So one of the really interesting things for us is that although we were very focused on the UK, oh, come on. Oh, spoil my, spoil my surprise. There we are. Um, although we were very focused on the UK, they've ended up everywhere. This is really something that we have our partners to thank for. Um, our, our largest market is now North America. Our largest per capita market, which I find really encouraging, is actually still the UK by a long way. So North America is slightly bigger than the UK. We're selling about a third, shipping between one and 200,000 units a month at the moment. Um, about a third of those into the UK, a third of those into North America, a third into the rest of the world. And the rest of the world mostly means, what, means Europe at the moment. But we are starting to see signs of life in South America, starting to see signs of life in India. Not much in the way of signs of life in China at the moment. And that's really something you want to work on over the next year. But it's just really encouraging that everyone wants to learn to program, right? Um, when we decided to manufacture this, we did the same thing with everyone. And so 
I gave you my thing that I'm concerned about, which is this openness issue and the closure of platforms. I'll give you the thing I'm optimistic about. When we decided to, um, when we, we started to manufacture this thing, we did what everyone did, which is to say, well, everything's made in China, right? Um, and so all of these, this pie was made in China, this was made by our contract manufacturer in Shenzhen. Um, and about a month after launch, um, we heard from a contract manufacturer in Wales who thought they could build it. Um, as of about six weeks ago, broadly a majority of Raspberry Pis are actually built in Bridge End. This lady's called Jane. Um, she's one of 30 people who manufactures Raspberry Pis in Wales. It turns out it's as cheap to manufacture in Wales as it is in the Far East. Um, and that was an enormous surprise to me. I think that it's the, the harbinger of a, of a trend that we're going to see a lot of. I think it's important now, whenever I get a chance to stand up in front of people, I bang the drum, that there's a crossover happened, right? Wages in China are going in one direction. Currency is going in one direction. Shipping costs are going in one direction. I think we have already crossed over to the extent that a well-organized, professional UK manufacturing operation can build very low-cost electronics like this more cheaply than you can build them in China. With effort. I mean, it took six months of effort from the foundation, from our partners, and from Sony our contract manufacturer, to make this happen. But it's just really, really encouraging. And it's great. You go in there, and then Raspberry Pi is shooting off the line at an incredible rate, about 2,500 a day. Um, so that was fun. Anyway, that's all of my slides. Um, slide share a few things with you. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I guess... Shall I just ask for questions? Well, I'll, I'll come up. Why don't you... Yeah, okay, okay. We'll give you a preliminary round of applause. Okay, thank you. Thank you.